and welcome everyone to the Real Talk podcast. Uh, I'm Barbara Layton, and I'm here with my dear friend and co-host Jim Vretros. And please excuse my very crooked mouth today because I just came from the dentist and I got a really nasty, hopefully effective root canal. Anyway, um, hopefully I won't be dribbling while I'm speaking. Uh, we're very excited to be doing this podcast um, as I think there is a uh, just a real yearning for real connection and uh, real conversation, which I believe is uh, stronger than ever before. But yet, at the same time, there's there seems to be an inner fear in doing that, um, oddly enough. The idea uh, and passion for the Real Talk podcast is for us in this community to just get to know one another uh, on a more intimate level, uh, digging a little deeper with questions and conversations that make us realize that at the end of the day, uh, we're not at all very different. You know, we get to share on this podcast our fears, our yearnings, uh, our insecurities, and our dreams. And discovering more of who we are as we share and empower one another with some real talk. What else is there? Jim? Absolutely. What else is there? Well. We are really going to get very real and very intimate. My lovely wife and partner is going to be our guest today. She is a nationally recognized uh, speaker. She's a psychotherapist. She's a, uh, a uh, sex therapist. She's the columnist for Dan's paper. She has her own show on Progressive Radio Network called Ask BD. Um, she does it all, and I am so proud and, and so happy to welcome her to Real Talk, B.D. Cohen Fredo. Hi, so nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. It's terrific. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. And I mean, you have quite the resume and experience <laughs> as uh, your fabulous husband uh, has said. So um, let's. Just get into it. Okay. So the first question I have for you is, what inspired you to pursue careers in sex therapy, writing, and psychotherapy? How did that all come about? Okay, it's a great story. When I was a little girl growing up in, in Winnipeg, Canada, for I think it was maybe my fifth or sixth birthday, my parents bought me a white transistor radio. Okay. Now, somehow, somehow, I used to take this radio to, to bed with me, and by some chance, by some miracle that actually changed my entire life, I found a show at midnight called Ask the Pastor, and it was a calling, counseling, radio talk show. What were you doing up that late? I don't know, Barbara. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea at all. Five, and six years I old, was, yeah. I was <laughs> enthralled. And every single Sunday night, I would listen to the show, Ask the Pastor. And I dreamed I wanted to have a calling counseling radio talk show. And of course, I've hosted many, many, many local, national uh, calling counseling radio talk shows. And that's how it began. And I just love the idea of helping people. Both my parents were very involved in helping people. What did your parents do? My mom was a teacher. My dad had farming uh, lands, and he was a writer. And in our home, we were always talking about the underdog and racism and income inequality, and it's so amazing, all the things that Jim and I talk about now all, all, all the time. And that was how I, I grew up. And all the little kids in the, in the neighborhood, they would come to me, and they would ask me questions about boys and relationships mm. and, and dating. So I never, ever had to think about what I was going to be doing. Mm. And so then... So you were a natural. I, I was, and I love it. And you know, and I tell people all the time, I never really feel like I'm working and about 25% mm. of the people that I treat, you know, have very serious psychiatric issues. And yet uh, the joy I feel from working with people and seeing people go from A to B to C to D and acknowledge and address and resolve their issues, 
I love it as much today, and I've been doing this now for over 35 years. Wow. Have a private practice here in East Hampton. I have a private practice in, in, in New York City. And it's my passion, Barbara and Jim, mm -hmm. as you as mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you were listening to the pastor. Mm -hmm. and what did so people would call in and yes. ask him about relationship issues. Relationships. So that click with you it did and and, and what did. was going on in the community in your own family that was also interesting in terms of you understanding relationships at that time what were your role models such a good question well my dad he mm. was a significant role model he was the father to all the children in the neighborhood Mm. And he would take us to the park and he would take us for, for ice cream. And if children were having problems, they would literally, literally, mm. Jim and Barbara, they would knock on our door and they would mm. say, can Mr. Sarah come out to play? And mm. that was my mm. main name. And he would come out and mm. we had every piece of sports equipment that you can imagine. Mm. And he was the man on the street who the children gravitated because to. you didn't have a private practice at that time no, I'm no. Dating, she, was a, she was a I child know, five six years old all right no. so but you were you yeah. were learning so, from the best yes i was and my mom was a teacher and I she was strict and she was not the most emotional person in the world with me the children loved her loved her and she taught for you know forever and and uh, i could see the kind of relationships that she had with the children and the parents. And, and so in my life, relationships mm -hmm. was key. The other mm -hmm. thing that was key, uh, I was number 10 in Canada as a national tennis player. The other thing that was key was never giving up. And how all that evolved was that one day, uh, my dad, who was my coach, often on the court, uh, we were playing tennis, and I couldn't hit a ball. And it was very mm. frustrating, and he took me for lunch, mm. and we <clears throat> discovered that the Manitoba Junior Tennis Championship was beginning that very day. And I said, Dad, I, I, I'd like to go. And it was really preposterous. I mean, you know, I had never been in a tournament. My, my strokes that day were horrible. So we went to the park. And somehow, he and I convinced them to let me in the draw. Hmm. I mean, I was nobody. Nobody knew about me. Unseated. I never... You were unseated. Un Literally. Unknown. And, Unknown. And, and Vinny, how old were you? I was 12. Okay. 12, wow. Okay. And my first round was with the current Manitoba junior tennis player, Cynthia Stubbs, who I will never forget. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up winning the Manitoba Junior wow. uh, 12 and under tennis Strong championship. Strong intention. Strong intention. Uh, mm -hmm. Never give up. Doesn't matter what the score is, whether or not it's on the court or in the game of life. And one of the things that I try to really encourage people to do, and I talk about this a lot on my Ask BD Radio Show on the Progressive Radio Network, is that we don't need to navigate the ups and downs of life on our own. And if you're lucky and you have family and, 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 and friends and a support system, that is a gift. But if you're unlucky, then the very best thing that you can do is reach out and ask for professional help. And it can make all the difference in the world. You know, really can. No, oh, that's beautiful. That's really, really beautiful. And your parents obviously instilled just great confidence in you and gave you that freedom to just be who you are. And they kind of went, went with you, went with that. Well, they, they did, but I didn't actually have the kind of confidence that I developed. I was a terrible student, Barbara. And Jim, you've heard this a lot. Yeah. In fact, my guidance counselor in Winnipeg uh, told me that I should not even think about going to college, really. Yeah. And I'll never forget sitting in her office. My grades were terrible. I mean, I was a tennis champion, a badminton champion, a ping pong champion, a skating person. I was not an academic, you know, much to the chagrin of my mom. 
And she said, no, I don't think that you should do that. And I came home and I told my parents and they said, oh, please, you know, once you find your niche. Mm -hmm. And of course, I ended up, you know, getting my master's of social work degree from McGill University. And I have postgraduate specialization in marriage and family therapy and sexual dysfunction, all from McGill, which is the Harvard of Canada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But no, I didn't have the confidence. And you know, it's so interesting that you say that, and maybe Jim, you've had the same experience, but mm -hmm. even myself growing up, I didn't have inner confidence mm -hmm. but, but with, with much of anything, but there was this other driving force mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. inside of me that just kind of propelled me to move forward no matter what even though I didn't have, almost like a fake it till you make it right. kind of thing. Right, mm. right, and, and so also what was like a force? Can and, you but also like a deeper knowing yeah. that, what's the worst that could happen? Right. right. What's the worst that could happen? And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. as a result, I mean, I grew up with every, you know, every endeavor that I've ever, you know, pursued, you know, my philosophy was walk to the edge of the cliff right. and just jump. Right. You don't have to cross every T and dot every I right. first. Right, exactly. Because that comes from a lack of self-confidence. Exactly. Is that familiar to you at all? Or? Very, very, very much so. I mean, I remember the first time I went to a radio station, and I had never done radio, and I was not confident. And in fact, when I think about my days in uh, Montreal, of course, where I did all my, my, my training, uh, the first day uh, during my you know graduate class, I could hardly say my name, Barb. And I realized that I needed to do something about this. If I was going to move into anything, and I hadn't even really thought seriously about the media, I needed to be able to stand in front of a group of people and say my name. So I took the Dale Carnegie course. The Dale Carnegie course changed my life, okay? It really, really did. I never could have done this. I never could have done radio. I never could have said my name in front of a group of people because I lacked the confidence. It took a lot of work and a lot of training to be able to sit here and feel a thousand percent relaxed. How old were you when you took that course? I was 22. Okay. 22. And it was hard, but I was determined. And of course, it helped me move up the social work, the Canadian social work ladder in a you know, variety of different capacities. But I remember that first day in my class. And it was like, tell me about yourself. And I, I, I really couldn't. I could hardly say anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first radio show I ever did was ABC. I wrote out, the producers, they could not even believe this. They probably wondered why Ron St. Pierre, who was the head of the radio station, even hired me. But I had every single word written out. Hello, my name is Petey. Because <laughs> I couldn't do it. I know that because I, I still do the same thing. And, you know, yeah, it, it, it's so interesting because... I think uh, talking, speaking in front of people is one of the yeah, top fears absolutely. Right? across the po absolutely. across the population. Right. right. Um, yep. And to overcome that, what advice would you give people who have that yearning but are terrified to speak publicly? Take the first step and get some training. Because I think it's re it for me, it would have been impossible to to do it on my own. And what what exactly have did you pinpoint what that fear was? Was it not being good enough? Was it what was it for you specifically? The fear of public speaking. Well, I think it probably was not being good enough and not being able to articulate what it was that I was feeling. The terror, and I remember that first time at the Montreal Royal Montreal Hotel in Montreal, was, which is where the classes were held like in person, of course, in those days. We had to get up, and my heart, it was just beating like a thousand, you know, beats a moment. It was like, oh my God. But every single week, and the classes were three-hour classes, every single week for months, for months, and every single week, it got better. And then we had props, so if I needed a prop to hold on to something, I remember one time I brought my tennis racket, so that was a comfort level for me to be holding on to my racket and giving a talk about tennis. But it took a lot of work, and whether or not we're talking about tennis or public speaking or relationships, we need to be willing, and I say this all the time, 
to do the work. And most people, I have to say, are not willing. We want it, but we don't want to do the work to really help us get to where we want to go. Hmm. Jen? I think it's true. I think it's true. I think you just have to dive in and keep at it, make mistakes, and learn from the mistakes. Um, I was always told by my grandfather, who you knew, uh, as well, you're a young kid. You're, you're a, a young, like a young tree. You're not going to break. You'll, you know, if you get the hits, you'll just swing here and then you'll come right back. And that's what people need to do in these tough times, in mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. COVID bearing times and the loneliness and, and, and so much is going on. But we need coaches uh, sometimes. Yeah, we need just, absolutely, we, to we, trust we, others and to send uh, and the community. That's what this show is also about. You know, I just want to show, like, in my own experience, I think part of what my fear was in public speaking was that what I had to say was not as important as what, say, somebody else uh, would uh, say, mm. and I wasn't as articulate as someone else. Okay. So that would that would stop me very, very often. And every once in a while, it still creeps up a little bit. Me too. Right. <laughs> yeah. Abs ab but absolutely. But just, just being less than. Right, right. I mean, we all have insecurities. Exactly. We all have self-doubt. I mean, that's just, it's part of the human condition. But it's about figuring out how do we get beyond that so that we can go to where we want to go and not and, allow that to impede us right. and stop us from reaching our, our dreams and our, and, our, and our goals. And also having support of people around you, isn't that... Very so, important. So important. The, the, the toxic person, the put down artist. And it, it, it's so very important to have those positive influences as well. Absolutely. And of course, Jim has heard me say this a thousand times I have a zero toxicity policy. No toxicity because a little mm -hmm. bit of poison mm -hmm. is poison. So once I do my assessments, which maybe we'll be able to talk about, you know, my, my, my book, How to Assess Who's Right for You and Who's Wrong for You Before Committing to Any Serious Relationship, which we all need, which I wish I had had when I started my own relationship life, it's very important, and I say this routinely, who we let into our lives. We have to be careful. And when we Talk to us a little more about that. Well, I think that what happens is that we're, we want to connect. And, you know, I think about the Golden Bachelor show right now. People, I don't know if people have watched it here in the studio, but, you know, 7 million people in the United States have been tuned into the Golden Bachelor. And right from the beginning, uh, I saw a number of red flags. And, of course, he is an admitted liar. He, he, he lied about his history. He said that he hadn't kissed anybody in 45 years. <laughs> After his wife died, he started dating somebody. A month later, he lived with a woman for almost two years. Mm. But the interesting thing is, is that America has let this character get away with all of his lies. Uh, they've been written up in various different publications, and I contacted probably 25 reporters, including Katie Couric's media, uh, and, and Sunny Hostin from The View, and nobody wanted to go further and talk about the fact that there are red flags, and there were red flags that were just staring us in the face. And this woman, Teresa, mm -hmm. was planning to mm -hmm. marry him mm -hmm. on national TV. I'm very concerned about her, and in fact, I was talking with Dr. Carol Lieberman, who is a world-renowned psychiatrist who's going to be on my radio show this week, and we both agree that this marriage should not go through, and yet people have been conned into this happily ever after fairy tale and ignoring significant, significant red flags and lies that this man actually acknowledged and he said, oh, well, they're really not important. Let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about positive things that are going on in our life. We have to be savvy. We have to be smart. Or we are going to suffer serious consequences. Uh, real talk. Real talk. Real talk yes. between, between individuals and not being, not being afraid of that. Exactly. Exactly.
You know, a little earlier we uh, we touched on just COVID a, a little bit um, and what's going you know what's going on with that. Um, I have two questions for you and Jim. You know, please sure, uh, sure, sure. Um, because I think a lot has happened since, and, and maybe Didi, in, in your um, in your field, you've seen it before. But the two questions I had for you was: um, How has the COVID pandemic? impacted communication and intimacy in relationships and what have you witnessed in your practice and secondly i wanted to ask um what are some challenges you see individuals and couples facing in today's world since COVID, and generally speaking uh in terms of the world at large so i think i think that with with COVID, what i'm seeing is a lot of self isolation. Now that COVID is mm -hmm. supposedly over, people are still not going out. People are online. They're on their devices 10, 15 hours a day. I see a lot. I treat two young uh, men in Chicago. How old are they? On, uh, in their mid-20s. Okay. And they don't go out. They work from home, which is an mm -hmm. issue. Uh, they don't go out. They are on Zoom. They are playing video games, and they have high-level jobs. So these are not stupid people. And uh, in fact, their sessions with me, they're lying in bed, sort of, you know, just sort of not in their pajamas, but just sort of lying around. And that's how they conduct their lives. And I've been trying to motivate them. You've got to get out, take a class, go to a gym, say hello. I think people are really, really reluctant to put themselves out. And I don't think that COVID caused it as such. It certainly didn't help. And I, I just hear, you know, all of these depressing thoughts and feelings. There are no good men. There are no good women. Of course, none of that is true. And um, I think that because of COVID, because of what happened, you know, during the, the, the two-year period, uh, the kind of in-person communication. I mean, my practice in New York City, 80%, 85% of it is on Zoom. I have a woman. I have a patient. Mm -hmm who I treat, who lives one block away, she will not come in. She will not come in. It has nothing to do with COVID. And so I think we've gotten into this, you know, kind of comfort zone that is not all that healthy. So even when you encourage these two young men to get out mm -hmm. and, and do something, mm -hmm. what do they respond? How do they respond well, to you? Well, we're, we're, we're tired. And what's really interesting with these two young men is they acknowledge to me, and of course, you know, wearing my sex therapy hat, that they're on the porn sites. So their sexual desires, you know, are being met apparently, at least at this point, by uh, spending hours every day, because I was asking one of them last week, I said, by the way, because I'm trying to get him to go out and take a class and talk to people and meet people, um, how many hours do you spend on the porn site? And he said probably between one and two every single day. And you have you seen an increase in that, say, Absolutely. over the last? Absolutely. Especially since COVID? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. In so, in all age groups? Yes. Or? In a, yes, in all age groups. I mean, the porn, the porn sites are doing very, very well, particularly the paid porn sites. Oh, yeah. It's become a substitution. Now, I don't have a problem with porn. If you want to bring it into your relationship and if you enjoy mm -hmm. pornography and it's not an issue, but to substitute... Uh, the human connection and the human sexuality for porn, I think it is becoming, you know, more and more and more of uh, an issue. I just wonder, since we are in East Hampton and we're a small town, and we also live in the city, is it the same thing here, a sense of community? Do people get out? Do they meet people? We went just yesterday to the, the Hanukkah party. The Hanukkah party. What what have you noticed here? Because it, uh, what you're saying is so important. And one would think that one could do that in a smaller town a little more readily. Than I the big would think, city. and Barbara, you could probably concur, I, I, yeah. that right. people do get out here. 
Do you think that's true? I think I, I'm I'm seeing uh, the isolation here as well. As well, really, I, I'm seeing the isolation here as well. People are very comfortable being home. Uh huh. And I think a lot of people are just getting into different things. And you know, I think some people are, you know, they're maybe in a not so healthy comfort zone. But I think others are just spending a lot more time going inside of themselves, mm -hmm. which is not a terrible thing as long as it's not an extreme. Right. What do you right. mean by that? Yeah, a more, more spiritual more, more spiritual, more self-introspection. Introspection. And, and, mm -hmm. needing, and needing that quiet. You need that quiet and alone time to be able to do that because, let's face it, the world is changing rapidly and drastically. Right. Right. So I think, you know, people may just need a little more of that. Right. So. But what we're seeing also, I mean, we have never seen the uh, clinical depression and suicide ideation and suicide mm -hmm. statistics ever mm -hmm. as high as they mm -hmm. currently are. And we need connection. I mean, the most important thing connection. in our life. It yes. is not money and yes. the big house on the water. It is this. It is talking. It is. It is. It's and we've only got a few seconds left. Oh, so why? Uh, I know it's. We, we, it need, an, we need an hour for yeah. this conversation. There's so well, much more. You have to come back. You'll have to, you, you have have to come back, Jim. Come back. We'll come back. We'll Absolutely. Come back. We'll do it. Okay, good. We'll do it. Good. And thank you Th so very much. Right? Thank you all. We're out of time. Stay real. Stay real. Real talk.